Hi there, I'm Chris Beckett. Thanks for asking me to make a video for Super Relax Fantasy Club. How's your lockdown going? I'm finding it very interesting, I think, is the right word to say. Uh, um, oddly enough, I've not been able to read a single book from one end to the other through the, for the entire duration of the lockdown. Tried a couple of times, just don't get anywhere. It's like my brain is simply too absorbed with thinking and just meditating on the world around me in some way. Um, not, not necessarily in an uncomfortable way, but just in an interested and curious way. It's odd. Obviously, I'm lucky. I've, my health's been okay. And everyone I know, their health's been okay. But as long as that lasts, I'm finding it quite interesting. Anyway, uh, I live in Cambridge, England. This is my kitchen. Um, I'm about to publish a new book, Two Tribes, comes out in July. Up to date, I've published um, seven novels, of which my seventh novel is this one, Beneath the World of Sea. Um, and I'm going to read from, the, read from that for you in a minute. Just to mention, by the way, that if you like short stories, I've decided to post um, some short stories on my website. Um, the duration of the lockdown, maybe I'll leave them there afterwards, I'm not sure. So there's 20 sh short stories that you can find up there at www.chris-beckett.com. You know, go and check it out if you fancy looking at some of my stories. Anyway, I'm going to read you now from the beginning of this novel. The Corpse Servants. The figure of the Polito appears in village folk folklore across the entire Submundo Delta. He has immensely long, stilt-like legs, skin that is completely white and a pointed tongue. He is usually depicted at least twice as tall as a normal human height, stick thin, with elaborately curled moustaches, a top hat and a brightly coloured waistcoat. He can fly through the air, make himself invisible and be in two places at the same time. He can also raise corpses from their graves to run errands for him. The corpse servants whisper the Polito's message, messages with grey, shriveled lips. There are many versions of the story, but in all of them, the Polito tricks the first Mondinos by opening some sort of door for them. Enter, my friends, he purrs, stooping almost double to bring his smiling face level with theirs. Enter, and you will come to a place of peace and plenty. They hesitate. My dear friends, there's no need to worry, says the Polito. His moustaches twitch, his long thin arms beckon them forward, his narrow pink tongue runs over his lips. As a token of my friendship, I will give you piglets and chickens to take with you, and tobacco plants and maize and tools, and a whole big sack of sweet potatoes. I will even give you goats. They look at each other, they accept the gifts, they step through the door. But the door leads into a cage just big enough to hold them all. It's a cage, but it's also a coffin, and the corpse servants laugh as they dig a hole for it. Ha ha, they hiss to themselves. Now the dead are burying the living. A dead will walk while the living lie where no one will ever find them. The corpses are immensely strong. They dig so fast and so deep that the coffin drops right through the earth, for the ground of one world is the sky of the world below. Hyacinth Young, Myths and Legends of the Submundo Delta. Chapter 1 The Policeman. Because the truth is, because the truth was what? It was obvious that he'd just written the words. The notebook was open in his lap, his pen poised over that final S. But Ben had no idea what he'd been about to say. And why was the sun suddenly shining? And what was that strange scent like nothing he'd smelt, ever smelt before? Only seconds ago, or so it seemed, he'd been sitting there on deck in the warm darkness of a tropical night with green rainforests passing by in front of him dimly illuminated by the deck lights of the boat. It had been seven days into the four-week river journey to the submarine de delta, and his excitement and anxiety had been mounting as he approached that band of territory surrounding the delta that was known as the Zona de Olvido. The Zona de Olvido, the zone of forgetfulness. That, of course, was the explanation, but, but though he had known in advance of the zona's unique and quality, and understood perfectly well that once he'd passed through it and come out again, no trace of your time there remained in memory. The actual experience was so sudden, so total, so shocking, that it took him several seconds to grasp what had happened. 
was like a cut between two scenes on a cinema screen. He'd been in that green forest at night, but now the sun was shining and he was right in the middle of something else entirely. He looked up from his notebook and there it was, the Submundo Delta, the delta beneath the world. The trees, if they could be, could be tall, called trees at all, came in shades of pinkish purple without the slightest trace of green and grew in a mass of spirals and helices, constantly recurring at many different scales of magnitude. Huge magenta leaf stems, the size of arms, uncoiled from the branches, then themselves unfurled smaller spirals from bead-like nodes along their lengths, these spirals in turn releasing rows of still smaller ones. And the branches were spirals too, spirals branching out from spirals, giving the effect of some kind of ornate three-dimensional calligraphy in an unknown and untranslatable language. They hung over the water, these branches, their tips curling back on themselves and yet more spirals, and put out delicate helical flowers, if flower was the right word, that were dazzlingly white except for their bright pink mouths. On a wooden hut that stood at the water's edge, a faded mural depicted grinning skeletons digging a grave, watched by a little group of living human beings confined inside a cage. While beneath the grave, a many-armed creature waited, its round head covered in eyes. The air was thick and humid, and that strange pervasive aroma wafted from the forest. A hint of burnt sugar in it, and honey, and bitter lilies, but something else too in there, that's so completely unfamiliar. Ben could find nothing to compare it with. The sky was covered in white translucent cloud through which burnt a huge white sun, seemingly much larger than in the world outside and with tiny flashes of pink, and blue and green glinting around its edges as if it was ringed with diamonds or splintered glass. Spitting out fumes of bilge water, the boat chugged steadily onwards through all this strangeness, the river twisting and looping like the one viable path through some vast, maze with constant side channels that tempted off its course. Some of these channels were navigable and marked with rusty signs bearing arrows, crosses, exclamation marks or the names of villages. Cado Sans Tantos, Bon Presagio, Aldo Mortos, but most of them were clogged with purple water plants and one was blocked by the half submerged wreckage of a Dakota plain, its exposed wing and fuselage covered with a twisted filigree pattern of some white and glistening growth. Ben was entranced. The coils and spirals stirred something inside him that was close to a nightmare, but that was part of the appeal. Half an hour had passed before he thought with a tiny twinge of unease about the vanished Zays in the Zono. Okay, well that's the beginning of Beneath the World of Sea. I hope it uh, caught your imagination. Thanks for inviting me on this podcast.